Hi everyone, welcome to PaleoArt and the never-ending quest for accuracy. This is a lecture that I gave just over a month ago at the Dinosaur Days event up at the London Wetland Centre. It's a talk about really the fundamental question at the heart of paleo artistry and that is how accurate are our reconstructions and you know in terms of their relationship with scientific data can they ever be truly accurate is there just one single way to restore an extinct organism um, this is a synthesis of ideas that i've published over the last few years and that other people have uh, you know have put together um, i think it's a really interesting topic and uh, hopefully you will too so many of you will be aware that paleo art is in a really interesting period right now. We're in this sort of very reflective postmodern age where people are really trying to break down what it is paleo art is really about. And this is being discussed in all sorts of different venues. There are lots of books that now discuss it here. You can see some of those in the top left hand corner of the screen. We have innumerable websites which talk about this. Lots of bloggers like to talk about paleo art and sort of what it really means, you know, the, the accuracy of our reconstructions, etc. And so much talk about these matters on social media. So if you're interested in this sort of thing, then you're, you're alive in the right time, basically. And I'd really recommend, in addition to listening to this lecture, uh, really go and check out some of these resources that are on the screen here if you want to know more uh, about what people think about, you know, where we're at with paleo art. And we can really define this reflective period as being broken up into sort of two main discussions. There are those that are questioning the scientific nature of paleo art and you know how how realistic it actually is to assume that we're reconstructing convincing interpretations of extinct animals and then there's the side of it which is looking at paleo art as more of a cultural phenomenon you know more of a sort of the the um the human side of paleo art you know it's working conventions it's fashions it's trends over time and this sort of thing now in this talk uh we as you might expect, are focusing more on the technical side of it, more on the scientific side. And we're going to try and see if there's any real basis to this idea that we are reconstructing extinct animals accurately. For it is the pursuit of accuracy that really has driven paleo art over the last few centuries, you know, as long as paleo art has, has existed, people have been trying to make things out of fossil data that reflect ancient realities. And I think we can define this as a fundamental part of paleo art. You know, I, I would say that if we're not interested in accuracy, if we're not interest, interested in the truth, as it were, then we're not really doing paleo art. And I think this, you know, we've had a lot of discussions over the last few years, uh, primarily catalyzed by Jurassic World and its complete disregard for modern paleontological science. Um, we've had a lot of discussions about, you know, what paleo art actually is, where do, where do the boundaries lie? And, you know, after some musing on this, I just think that, well, things like the you know movies like Jurassic World well they're not really paleo art at all they're paleontologically inspired media but they're not really paleo art it, you know, for something to be paleo art it has to have that component of striving for accuracy doesn't necessarily mean it is accurate but it has to be giving it a go so if we go back into the history of paleo art which might extend all the way back into maybe the uh, 17th century um, we can see that there has been this striving for accuracy you know over over time and we can really look at paleo art the history of it as moving towards tighter and more constrained hypotheses of, of life appearance and and you know more constrained interpretation of fossil animal form and so you know if we look at some of the earliest attempts to interpret fossil animals you know they are really quite bizarre but you know this would give credit to these people you know they're working in the in the 17th century looking on the screen here you can see unicorum verum uh, this is an assemblage of rhino bones and mammoth bones found in caves in germany in the, uh, in the in the 17th century and you know people were making the most sense out of these things that they could they are accurate to their knowledge at the time you know they don't know that unicorns don't exist at this point in in our history we haven't explored the whole world yet um, uh, but obviously as time has moved on we've developed much more uh, in-depth understanding of the natural world we have a better understanding about what is actually out there so you know we can probably strike unicorns off the list uh, we've got a better idea of how animal anatomy works and so you know from the 1800s onwards our paleo art has become far more recognizable for me the modern age of paleo art really starts in about 1800 we see it sort of developing uh 
to up until the modern day, you know, from those very early beginnings of, of just scholars scribbling down life rest restorations on the back of their notes uh, through the, you know, popular works like um, Henry de la Beche's Duria Antiquor, right up until the modern day with Bob Nichols' fantastic Cetacosaurus model that was unveiled earlier this year. And we can see, the, you know, that this is this marching towards uh, a, a better synthesis of fossil animal form and, uh, and, and life appearance. And it brings us to a to me a, a pretty fundamental question: How many ways can we reconstruct extinct animals? And this, for me, is really inspired by a quote by uh, a very influential, very important paleo artist, Gregory S. Paul. In '87, Paul said, "The common assertion that is always that there is always more than one way to restore a given animal is not true." And for me, that that was really significant. I remember reading that as a teenager and thinking, you know, wow, that's you know that that's a, a pretty pretty remarkable thing. We have to bear in mind that the context in which Paul was writing this was a very different world to the one that we live in today. Back in the 20th, 20th century, uh, you know, life appearance of dinosaurs was all over the place. And, you know, I remember growing up as a kid, my dinosaur books had everything in them from the Charles Knight and the Burian reconstructions that are on the screen there. There were also works by people like Eli Kish, which are completely different to anything I'd seen before, much leaner, uh, very different muscle profile. And then we had John Civic, you know, you, you can't have grown up in the 80s or 90s and been a dinosaur obsessed, obsessed kid and not seen John Civic's work. We had stuff like Jurassic Park. Um, all these animals look completely different. These are all, everything on the screen here is meant to be more or less the same species. These are all Tyrannosaurus or Tyrannosaurines. And you look at them and they're completely different. They have very different head shapes. They have very different muscle profiles, very different ideas about animal bulk, even you know some different ideas about proportions. And um, so yeah, we have to look at Paul's quote as emerging from that period of confusion where there were all these conflicting reconstructions of fossil animals. And in that sense, you can kind of see where he's coming from. Because what Paul stressed for us is that Paleo art can be informed on just about every single level. Now, that doesn't mean that we know everything about the appearance of fossil animals and the world they lived in, but it does mean that, you know, it's not just a case of anything goes. We can use their osteology to get an idea of their basic form. We can use their footprints to get an idea of their gait and their carriage, you know, how they, how they walk and how they run. We can use modern animals to get a good idea of how their muscles are laid over their uh, over the underlying skeleton we do have a lot of soft tissue data not as much as we'd like but we do have soft tissue data which we should be considering when putting our animals back together and then there's the geological data you know when it comes to restoring the world that our animals live in well actually using sedimentology and stratigraphic approaches we can actually produce some very detailed pictures of what the environments of the past looked like uh, and you know complementing this and you know really de deserving its own talk is paleobotany you know we much of what we do for, for fossil animals can be applied to fossil plants as well so paul really put all this on the table more than anyone has done um you know ha had done at, at that point you know that's i think this is one of paul's greatest contributions to paleontology and to paleo art is how he really you know, stress that no, there is a way that we should be doing this. We can't just do whatever we want. We there is a process to follow here, but that still leaves us with the question: Is there just one single way to restore these animals, or is there still, even despite all the information that we have, is there still some wiggle room, you know, some variation in this area for us to, um, you know, for, for, for us to play with? And so to answer this question, you know, do, do we have enough information to be genuinely accurate? Um, I think the answer is mostly no. The amount of information that we require to restore a fossil animal completely in terms of, you know, knowing that we're actually getting something pretty close to what the animal looked like is really quite tremendous. We need a complete skeleton, ideally in three dimensions. We need a very good idea of its soft tissue anatomy, you know, its muscle plan, its um, the, the, the details of its integument. Um, we ideally want some idea of its color. We need to know what it's closely related to so we can get that muscle plan uh, built up properly, you know, make sure that any information we have to infer from other relatives is, is well constrained. Um, the fact is we can't do that for the vast majority of fossil animals. Um, the quality of fossil data is just not there for the overwhelming majority of species. So there probably are some animals that we can reconstruct in a fairly accurate way, but they are in the minority. This is a handful of species that we can do, do this with. 
if you have a look on the graph on the screen here, this graph is not quantified in any way. This is just sort of a, a graphic representation of you know, what I'm trying to express here. Um, we can see that the reliability of reconstruction uh, really decreases quite rapidly with the quality of, of, of uh, fossil data. And most of what we're doing is restoring animals in a sort of a credible way when we have enough information to get some idea of what's going on. But then some of our reconstructions are you know, even less so, uh, even less credible than that. Some of them, there is just so little information to be going on that we have to really regard them as, as pretty speculative. And what I'd like to do for um, for the rest of the talk is discuss some of the ways that our ability to be accurate is uh, is impinged by the quality of the fossil record and other factors as, as well. So one of the main issues we have is just sort of raw availability of data and knowing which direction to move our paleo art in. And uh, if I can use a, a famous example here of, of giant Ashdarkia pterosaurs, picture on the screen there, that shows pretty much what most of us would imagine a giant Ashdarkia pterosaur would look like in life, you know, with these long necks, these long heads, these proportionally short wings. But actually underneath those reconstructions, you find that there is not a huge amount of scientific data. So on the screen here, we've got two silhouettes. We've got um, Quetzalcoatlus species at the bottom. That's a uh, relatively, it was a medium sized ash dark, I guess, about a four to five meter wingspan. Above that, you've got the silhouette uh, skeletal reconstruction of Aramborgiania. And you can see how little material there actually is in forming the life appearance of uh, of that giant pterosaur in particular. The story is pretty much the same for the other giant ash darkids as well. There is not much to them. Um, obviously, the, the, the reconstruction on the previous slide is based really closely on Quetzalcoatlus. You can see that the, the skeleton of that is pretty well known. Um, and so, you know, what we've typically done is just scaled that up to the size of something like Aramborgiania and said, yeah, this is what we think this animal looks like. What we're now learning about Ashdarkids is that there's actually a lot more variation in them than we have previously realized and that maybe Quetzalcoatlus is not this sort of, you know, a model that can be applied to all taxa. Um, the problem is we just don't know. We do have these variable anatomies in Ashdarkids and it's not always really clear as to which one we should use to fill in the gaps of our more poorly known species. So Aramborgiania may not just be a scaled up version of Quetzalcoatlus, it might have a short face, it might have a concave dorsal margin of the skull, it might have short wings. Uh, we don't know. It's, um, it, it's, it's, you know it, it's a bit of a mystery there. And this is a, a very common problem. A lot of our more famous fossil taxa are not known from anywhere near like complete skeletons. And so what we end up with, are, you know, these the sort of classic reconstructions of these animals are based on um, you know, sort of composites of, of, of different individuals, or they're based on a lot of extrapolation and speculation, you know, using close relatives. Um, in many cases, it's not clear which of these reconstructions is particularly valid, you know, which one stands up above the rest of going, yeah, this is what this animal actually looked like. And I think a take home here is that we, in, in paleo art, uh, as with any aspect of paleontology, we're not reconstructing a, an ancient truth we're reconstructing interpretations of these animals. We're reconstructing essentially hypotheses. And like any, um, you know, like, like anything in science, hypotheses can be tested and they can change over time. Um, and it's not clear to us which of these hypotheses will stand up and which ones, um, you know, which ones will, um, which ones will, will fall by the side over time. But that's just, you know, that's just where we are with paleo art. We can't pretend that we're producing anything that we know is actually going to stand the test of time. And it's sort of interesting when, when we look at this from a, a cultural perspective, I don't want to go too far down this route, but it's interesting that we do get pretty hung up on some of these reconstructions that, you know, we may not know necessarily correct, but we, we start to kind of really defending them. We don't like things when they change. And so a good example of that is uh, is the, the, the growing amount of filaments and feathers that we're finding in uh, in dinosaur species, you know, we're learning that an awful lot of these things were somewhat fuzzy in life. And yet there's there's a lot of resistance to this idea still, you know, in spite of the overwhelming evidence that we have. Uh, a lot of people just don't, don't like this idea and they don't like stretching it any further than they have to. Even when, when we really think about it, a lot of our classic re reconstructions of dinosaurs well, you know, the, the ideas that we've had about their skin and their life appearance have never been particularly well constrained in the first place, but we've just become very familiar with these reconstructions. And so we sort of like to hold on to them. Now that's kind of a slightly slightly different talk. I don't want to go off on that, that angle there, but I, th I think it's a valid point to make, you know, that um, 
we, we maybe do need to be a little bit more open-minded about what we really know about these creatures and the fact that you know in many cases we are um you know we're, we are restoring these these ideas which can be changed quite rapidly you know we have a far less of a hold on some of these things than we may may intuitively uh, appreciate Moving on, we have to realize that our ability to interpret fossil anatomy is limited. So even when our fossil data is relatively complete and we have a you know good maybe a good skeleton of an animal, that doesn't mean that we can get all the information that we need from those fossil remains to restore the life appearance of an animal accurately. Now, I don't want to undermine uh, our ability to interpret fossil animals because I think we can actually do it. Uh, you know, considering the information that we have, I think we can do some pretty remarkable things, uh, you know, to, to learn what fossil animals may have looked like. Uh, a great example of that, I think, is when we think about fossil eyeballs. Now, you know, who would have thought that we could say anything about the appearance of the eyeballs of fossil animals? And yet we can, if we have their sclerotic rings. These are these little plates these uh, of bone that exist inside the eye sockets of many fossil animals, you know, very famously in fossil reptiles reptiles like ichthyosaurs and um, when we have those we can actually get an idea of where the eye was visible in the animal in life and so in ichthyosaurs for instance we know that despite the fact that they have these enormous eyes you know these these eye sockets that really dominate the skull we know that in life they are uh, their eyes were not these big sort of bug eyes you know they weren't these huge sort of things that look like they belong on the side of a fly or something like that um, they were actually a lot smaller in life. You know, the, eye, the eyeball itself would be very big, but the, the visible amount of eye would just be what is uh, what could poke through the inner ring of the uh, of the sclerotic ring. And that's pretty cool. You know, that, that, as I say, I don't want to undermine what we can actually say about fossil animals and about their uh, about their life appearance. We can do some remarkable stuff. It's just that for every one example where we can know things, there's probably about 10 examples of things that we don't understand. And so a good example of this is whether or not fossil animals had covered, covered or exposed teeth. Um, you know, th there are innumerable reconstructions of things like Tyrannosaurus and Smilodon and Gorgonopsids with teeth hanging out of their mouth in one way or another. And, you know, there are interesting discussions to be had about how valid those reconstructions are. When we have a look at modern animals, you know, our best insight into the development of soft tissues in, uh, in extinct forms, we just find so little correlation between the underlying osteology and the presence of tooth covering that basically for fossil animals it is a bit of a guess. You know, we, we, we don't really have the, the tightly constrained method of reconstructing lips and cheeks in, that, in these animals that we might like. Fatty tissues are another good example of an unknowable uh, quantity in, uh, in, in fossil animals. We know that living animals have these big sort of uh, humps in parts of their bodies. In some cases, they have big fatty tissues, big you know, adipose deposits in different parts of their bodies as water storage. Um, these really do quite dramatically change the appearance of these animals. Uh, you know, think about a camel without its hump; it looks really strange. Um, but we have no idea where how to actually detect these in fossil animals. We know that they were almost certainly there, but actually detecting you know whether or not they they existed or not is something that we can't currently do based on underlying osteology you know we see things like sails and we see these strange structures on the vertebrae of, of fossil animals and sometimes we link them to humps and things but they actually seem to have very little correlation with uh with underlying osteology in modern animals you know we kind of fail that test in that respect and compounding this problem is that even when we have good soft tissue preservation on our fossils, um, a lot of the time it's open to interpretation. We have to remember that we're looking at the fossils of you know, animals that were decaying. You know, we're looking at, at the preservation of carcasses, not necessarily of pristine animals that you know were, were sort of buried alive. And that means that you know, in some cases we can look at the same fossil and people can come away with very different interpretations of that. And a good example of that uh, for me is the Chinese Therizinosaur Baeposaurus. You can see on the screen here uh, the fossil of this guy in the top right hand corner and there's a whole bunch of feathers around its neck. To me they look very much like the kind of conical tube of feathers that we have um, on living bird necks. For other people like Gregory Paul, um, he sees a couple of crests sticking off the off the head and neck, and, and that's how he's reconstructed it. So it looks very, very different. Um, with the current available fossil data, you know, you can kind of see 
or I, ho I hope you can understand why we might have this this, this conflict of uh, of interpretation. You know, to, to me, both ideas are you know not 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 uh, not implausible. And it, it, again, you know, there's very little in the way of help that can be found in modern animals. If you go and read a book like The Unfeathered Bird, you can see just how difficult it is to get good relationships between underlying osteology and overlying soft tissue data. You know, it's just it's really hard to know sometimes which of these different interpretations we have is the valid one. Adding a, an additional layer of complication to this is that we know that there are anatomies that have existed in the past which are not represented today. If you like, these are extinct forms of anatomy. And a, a good example of this is the soft tissue anatomy of uh, Colindodromius. This is a small ornithischian dinosaur which has got some really bizarre integumentary structures on it. So, you know, we're used to talking about dinosaurs in terms of do they have scales, do they have feathers or filaments? Well, this thing has a bunch of stuff which isn't really either. Uh, it's somewhere in between. And we have no modern analog for this. This is, you know, this is not a, 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 a sort of filament or, or scale that we have existing in the modern day. Uh, if you look on the right hand side of the screen there, you can see the sort of thing I'm talking about. These are these small plate like scales, which you've got these bizarre fibers actually growing out of them. Uh, really bizarre things. Um, what do they look like in life? We don't know. Um, we can try and draw them the best we can based on the fossils that we have, but we don't have a modern representative to just go and look at, to copy from. Um, and that's just another layer of uncertainty to add to our uh, paleoart re reconstructions. Uh, we've primarily been talking about this from the perspective of vertebrates, but actually once we move away from things like dinosaurs and you know other uh, relatively well understood fossil tetrapods and we start looking at things like invertebrates, it just gets even more complicated because their anatomy is far more diverse and it's you know it's nowhere near as sort of conservative as we see in things like fossil tetrapods. So these problems are are there tenfold in many of our fossil ver invertebrates. And for me, I think that's a, that's a pretty significant problem because actually these animals are really common. Uh, they should be featured in our paleo art a lot more than they are. But uh, the, the fact is that it's actually really difficult to know what some of these things look like. Even things as common as, as ammonites or graptolites, I've got no idea what these things actually look like in, uh, in life. It's very difficult to interpret their anatomy from the fossil remains that we have. And so of course, you know, discussions like this have given rise to a pretty pretty important book in uh, in, in the modern world of paleo art. This is all yesterday's. For many of us, this will need uh, no introduction. Um, all yesterday's argues that actually these problems are so commonplace that we just need to sort of ignore them and and use informed speculation and inference to uh, fill in these significant gaps. You know, we just kind of just have to go for it and hope that we're hope that we're doing the right thing and maybe not get too worried about whether or not our reconstructions are accurate or not. Worry more about producing convincing reconstructions rather than strictly accurate ones. And I think that's, you know, that, that's a pretty positive message for, for paleo art. And I think it's certainly had a, a strong influence on the current generation of paleo artists. Now, a third major factor in our quest for accuracy is, um, is something we don't talk about that much in, in paleo art. This is how artists are actually influenced by our own perception of the natural world. I mean, when we think about what we're trying to do in paleo art, we are trying to reconstruct ancient realities. You know, we're trying to reconstruct ancient forms of nature. And that means that the way artists perceive the modern world is a pretty significant part of the reconstruction process. You know, we're going outside, we're having a look at how nature actually works. We're looking at how animals interact. We're seeing how they, uh, what modern environments are like these then get weighed in against all the other information that we need to um, to put our paleo art together. And, you know, this all gets kind of crunched together through our paleo artist brain. And then the artwork comes out the other side and it does reflect, you know, in, in a quite a quite a large way, the understanding that the artist has of how nature works in the modern day. And we can see that artists have very contrasting ideas about what fossil animals may have been like. You know, this, this, uh, their, their underlying assumptions about the mechanics of nature and the, and the parts of nature that they want to stress in their paleo art are really quite different. I mean, you, you can see that stressed very well here in these two completely different interpretations of Tyrannosaurus. One of them shows Tyrannosaurus as this sort of uh, kind of gentle looking creature really you know it's just there it's having a bit of a nap uh it's got a kind of soft rounded face it's got um 
it, it's, it's, its basic anatomy is quite sort of soft and well-rounded. Um, on the other hand, we've got a picture of Tyrannosaurus as a, a far leaner creature, you know, looks a lot more savage. And look what it's doing, you know, this is uh, a million miles away from this as a, as a sort of a peaceful sleeping creature. This is Tyrannosaurus ripping a triceratops apart. There's blood and gore and all sorts coming out of this thing. Um, and each of these pictures are sort of equally valid, if you like, you know, we couldn't really choose between them in terms of which one is accurate and which one isn't. And it's not just animal behavior where we see this difference in opinion over how the natural world works. You know, this comes across in, in things as, as fundamental as raw anatomy as well. If you look at the therizinosaurs on the screen here, we see one of the picture, the picture on the left, emphasizing the kind of the softer, fluffier nature of extinct animals and if, of, of extinct, um, extinct dinosaurs. You know, this, this animal looks a, a lot a lot more docile than the picture on the right where um, because of the anatomy and because of the way this animal's reconstructed it's really lean it's wielding its scythe its claws like a kind of scythe look at the way they're gleaming in, in in the sun there it's got this sparse bristly covering of, of feathers rather than having uh, this sort of really big fluffy uh, appearance and you know th these are meant to be the same animal but because because these different artists have got uh, seemingly quite contrasting views of what the natural world is like, they portray their animals in a very, very different way. And these decisions can really start to build up. You know, if you look at any uh, paleo artwork, you're looking basically at a huge number of artistic decisions influenced by the perception of the natural world uh, and how we think these animals behave, you know, what we think their characters were like in life. Um, and he, he, as I say, you know, these things really do build up throughout a painting. And so what we're, what we're seeing, even with all the scientific data that we have informing these pictures, we're still seeing quite personal pieces of work, you know, in terms of how these artists are trying to express what they think the natural world is actually like. And sometimes these things can dominate, you know, really dominate fundamentally the, the compositions of our artworks. You know, so we see in the picture here, this, um, this composition is entirely dominated around, around the fact that uh, this artist, in this case me, has assumed that this ankylosaur has got a pretty bad temper and is throwing his weight around. And there's no scientific reason to think that's the case. It's just simply that this is how we think, uh, this is how I thought, this is how I assumed this animal works. Um, and so we can, putting all these different points together, we can go back to our question, how many ways can we reconstruct an extinct animal? And the answer has to be many. Because even when we have our objective scientific information, you know, our, our, our scientific evidence and, and our data, there is a lot to, still a lot to play with. You know, we have uh, varying amounts of data quality. We know that we have to speculate somewhat on life appearance. We know that there's this kind of personal aspect that artists bring to their work. And so, the, you know, these things mean that actually, yeah, there probably are many ways to reconstruct extinct animals, even when we're all going from the same starting point. Uh, all from the same starting point. And so what does this mean for accuracy? What does this mean for you know, this, this pursuit of accuracy that we have? Well, for me, I think it means that this concept of accuracy is a little bit slippery. Uh, I think we have to appreciate that we can only reconstruct the best available hypotheses available to us at the time. We can only um, you know, we can't necessarily future-proof our ideas, we can't future-proof our work, we can only work with the information that we currently have available to us. We know in some instances that, the, um, that there are multiple hypotheses of ancient animal appearance and ancient animal behavior which are valid at the same time. You know, we can have two or more concepts of what an animal may have been like and we can't necessarily choose between one of them as for which, is, you know, which one is, is the better one. And we also know that much of what we need to put into our paleo art is untestable. It's unknowable. You know, there are things that we need to do that the fossil record does not provide us with the evidence for. And, it, you know, we basically have to rely on speculation and inference to fill in far more of the gaps in our knowledge than many of us would like to admit. And so I think what this, what this means for me is that this idea of accuracy is probably flawed. I think what we're looking for is actually credibility. I think we're, we're looking for artwork which doesn't pretend to be a, a single sort of everlasting accurate interpretation of a fossil animal in terms of its life appearance and behavior, but something which is simply credible to all of the information that we have available to us at the time when we make the artwork. And I think that's quite an important point. I think this is something that uh, can really change the way that we view paleo art, not just as a, um, 
not just as a sort of an outreach medium, but also in terms of how we can appreciate the history of um, the history of paleo art itself. And what I mean by that is that if we think about the history of paleo art and the sort of the, the, the way that our reconstructions have evolved over time, we start to realize that paleo art is perhaps less about capturing definitive pictures of the past and more about recording the progress of paleontological science. Um, you know, if we look back at things like the Waterhouse Hawkins uh, Crystal Palace dinosaurs and that sort of thing, they look so very different to how we interpret dinosaurs today. But at the time, they were, you know, they were just as valid a reconstruction as uh, as our modern reconstructions are. It's just that the science underneath all this has changed quite a lot. Um, and for me, I, I think that's that's really what paleo art is more about uh, fundamentally. I, I think we have maybe we're uh, fooling ourselves if we think that we are doing something anything more than that uh, and I don't think that's a problem I think that's actually something to celebrate paleontology is a unique science in having this record of um, you know this artistic record of changing ideas and changing theories and I, I think that's um, that's something to really embrace as artists ourselves you know if we recognize that what we're doing is more developing this record of uh, of, of paleontological science it sort of liberates us from certain constraints and from, you know, certain um, narrow ways of thinking about producing our art. And what I mean by that, we can be more open minded um, about exploring the current data that we have, you know, when, when it comes to filling in gaps that we need, you know, that filling in these unknown parts of fossil animal appearance and behavior and things, that we can look at all the options available to us and not necessarily worry about which one is the quote right one and which one is, is the wrong one. We can just say, well, you know what, we don't know which of those is right at the moment. So let's just do all of them. Let's, uh, you know, let's really embrace the kind of the unknown parts of that and think, well, where can we take our art to um, that, that, uh, that it hasn't gone to before. Let's really explore the data that we have available to us. We can be more open to new ideas, you know, and really embrace the kind of the, the, the novelty uh, in, in science at the time that we're working. So things like, you know, lots of new ideas on the screen here. We've got the Bronto smash hypothesis. We've got omnivory in ornithischians. We've got swimming, diving pterosaurs. Um, this is all cool new stuff. And I think it, it's great for us to really own that. What these really come down to is us trying to capture the current picture of paleontological science. You know, the time when when we are working, when um, it's, it's not about just drawing the same animals over and over again, doing the same thing, but it's trying to say, yeah, this is what paleontological science was saying when I was alive. And I, I think that's, you know, that's a pretty, um, that's, that's, a, that's a, a, an important part of my own work ethos, at least, is to actually say, you know, this is, um, this is where we were. And I, I don't think it's a problem if we're wrong. I mean, I think we, we worry a lot about whether or, or not our work will become outdated. Uh, for me, I, I think we need to remember that even if our work is superseded, um, it will always have value as a record of scientific development. Um, indeed, you know, I think there are some really uh, good examples, some classic examples of paleo art where they've actually attained more value because of their historical significance rather than their sort of contemporary scientific significance. You know, again, you know, I've already used these as, as an example once, but the Crystal Palace dinosaurs are a, a terrific example of that. Things like the Zalinger mural are a really good example of that. Um, these are things that we would never want to get rid of. You know, we don't we don't look at them and say, oh, they're terrible bits of artwork. We They, they now have this um, irreplaceable value in the history of, of paleontological science. So I say embrace it, you know, I think to, let's just say, let's um, make artwork which is representative of what we know today. Let's really explore what our current idea of paleontological science is and, uh, and reflect that in our artwork. And so let's just try and sum sum up those, uh, the, those, those main points. I think that accuracy then is something which it's actually quite difficult to work with as a paleo artist. So I think we need to acknowledge this idea that there is a single um, interpretation that we can present of any single fossil animal is uh, is false. I don't think that's a helpful idea for us. Um, this is mainly because you know the fossil data is just not there to give us enough information. Yeah, we are reconstructing hypotheses of animal life appearance and behaviour. We are not re reconstructing single irrefutable irrefutable truths and thus what we're really looking for is artwork which is credible to scientific ideas and scientific information not necessarily a single accurate 
uh, interpretation of the past. And I think this is something that um, that you know we may need to acknowledge a little bit more and, and embrace a bit more. Um, because I think it can actually make our artwork a lot more interesting and, uh, and maybe even add value to it uh, over time. You know, if we can be a little bit more, um, if we can try and communicate more about how we were understanding paleontology, um, you know, when we were making paleo art, that actually has more value for the next generation than worrying about future proofing our work or, you know, worrying about making sure that we're producing the one single right interpretation. And if you've enjoyed that lecture, then there's a lot more discussion about, um, you know, sort of the, the ideas that can go into paleo art and the sort of this idea of accuracy versus credibility in my latest book, which is currently available from all major online retailers. So do go and check that out as, as, as well if you'd like more discussion on this point. And um, that's pretty much it. So I hope you've enjoyed that and um, I'm sure there'll be another video up soon.